Pusikan Crossfeed. San Juan, California. Yes, you can have a Bible study in your home. Rupert Murdoch. But just try having one without paying me. Sweet. It's okay if your Bible study consists of file swapping. Canada, but with only one spouse. And Jerome Corporation. We suggest a study on stem cells. Hello, everybody. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts at St. Luke's Lutheran Church. And I do mean beautiful. We, we have been enjoying just a beautiful winter. It was yeah. 60 degrees yesterday. Yeah, winter hasn't really arrived here. Uh, so. I had some snow a while back, but I don't know. Um, it's supposed to cool off this weekend, so we'll see. Yeah, it's supposed to cool off here, but made a week it was very cold. But uh, I uh, was reading some article, a letter to the editor in the paper today, and they were talking, about, you know, complaining about climate change and this winter that we haven't had, and all the problems it's going to cause. And I wanted to say, you know, on the other hand, I know a lot of elderly who love it because they can get out. Uh, I know a lot of people whose you know heating gas bills are very low, and they're not complaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there are some real pluses to this. A lot of companies saving money on plowing. Yeah, it's towns and cities out here. Churches. Saving money on plowing. Yeah, churches, yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of people, you know, yeah, I feel bad for the guys who are plowing. I mean, it's always good and bad. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people are just really not, like, this is nice. I like this. Saving us a lot of money. And heat and plowing. I don't have a problem with that. <clears throat> so, so well, happy 2012 to everybody. Yes, and, happy 2012, and I do hope you all had a good Christmas. Yeah. Ours was very nice up here, so it uh, wasn't out a white Christmas by any means, but uh, it was a well-attended Christmas, so. Well, that's good. I had, you know, Christmas was, uh, it was kind of chaotic around here, uh, around our house, just, you know, we've had some changes in our family the past year, and, and things, you know, weren't, it, it was just real hectic, and, um, and, and I, I, Christmas Eve. I mean, we had two really nice uh, Christmas services and uh, Christmas Eve services, you know, and um, and 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 they were they were great. Um, our first, our our seven o'clock service. I think we had more visitors there than we had members because our members mostly come go to the um, eleven p.m. candlelight service. Um, but I mean, so that was pretty cool and and stuff. But I I was I was really feeling kind of down when I went to bed Christmas Eve. And then Christmas Day, um, during the service, um, during the Nicene Creed, we're reading this, you know, together, and and I'm reading, um, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and um, and you know, you look at at. You know, Jesus Christ is only Son, our Lord. Uh, uh, you, you get the, this whole um, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. You know, and and you get this this awesome, majestic description of the Son of God, and then you get um, He came down from heaven for us and for our salvation, and you know was incarnated by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. You know, and, and and you go, and it just like it just hit me. I mean, like you know, we read this thing all the time, but it just hit me. And maybe it was just the context of Christmas, or or, or maybe it was because I was short on sleep, or I don't know what it was, right? But um, it it was just like, wait, so you know, huge, majestic Son of God, for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven. And mm-hmm. just and it just like it just slammed into me and 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 just the the rest of the service I just couldn't get past that you know um, it, it just kept going through my head and I, I shared it with the congregation afterward and it, and it was just it, it it all of a sudden everything like Christmas fell into place you mm-hmm. know it was like yeah as the genie says in Aladdin Aladdin. All cosmic power in a very little living space. <laughs> so, 
So. <laughs> See, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who draws from more pop culture references for, for, for different things. People are just like, you know, I can never watch a show the same way twice after listening to you because there's going to be something. Actually, it's kind of funny that we were talking on Facebook TV shows that we like and a bunch of the guys, uh, a couple of people are real fans with me of uh, Once Upon a Time. And I said, every episode you should come away with at least two certain illustrations. <laughs> you know. Uh, things you can pick up and think of. And- well, you know, I, um, I we did the Epiphany text today, and um, and Shrek made an appearance uh, in ours uh, because of uh, I I referenced uh, Balaam and his prophecy uh, about the Epiphany, and uh, to me, obnoxious guy with a talking donkey, you know, oh, that's yeah. that's Shrek, <laughs> and uh, so. So, uh, yeah, you'd be amazed at what, what, what references I make. Um, I think a lot of people are, are, often are. But uh, anyway, we need to get moving on this. Uh, let's start with the one that I said to me, I think, just shocked the heck out of me. And that was the one from, uh, uh, I think, it's Geron Corporation or uh, Geron Corporation out in Menlo Park. Um, now, this is one of the companies that for year has done biomedical research on embryonic stem cells. And a couple of weeks ago, and, and about, uh, about six weeks ago, back in the middle of November, they announced that they are doing away with it. Um, this, they're going to focus strictly on adult stem cells. And the reason is nothing was happening with the embryonic stem cells. Yeah, it's too expensive to keep pursuing it. You know, but and there was nothing was happening. Yeah, yeah. Like they they, they did a couple a couple uh, studies and and what they have to report, there were no adverse effects, no positive effects, <laughs> but no, you know, like nobody died. <laughs> Like, oh, great! It was you know, it was the equivalent of a placebo. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was interesting just looking at the comments um, section that um, you know, uh, people treating heart failure in Florida with stem cell therapy have said they see great success. Uh, see Reuters and and you know, and there, there's some little confusion there about um, anytime we talk about this and, and most of our viewers are probably familiar with this but um, as the person comments in response to that if you look closely you'll probably find that they're using adult stem cells which have been used successfully in a number of therapies yeah adult stem cells are being used all over the place and anytime you hear stuff about stem cell research you always have to stop and look are you talking about adult stem cells or embryonic stem cells and um, embryonic stem cells, we're talking about taking an actual embryo, a, a, a child, right, and treating that child like a jigsaw puzzle and, and pulling them apart into a bunch of pieces um, and and then injecting those pieces into human beings. Um, as opposed to what's more like an organ donor, where you're taking pieces from... Uh, like for instance, umbilical cord blood, or um, oh, there's a number of different places where you can get stem cells from, and it doesn't have to be an adult, but it's you know it's easier to get consent and all that from adult. Thought I heard a while. Oh. Anyway, um, so uh, also in, uh, stem cells from umbilical cords. I've heard of that too. So, um, yeah, and there's a, there's a number. I think it's like from the cheek cells or something like that. You can. Get them. I don't remember, but um, the point is, is that you can get stem cells without killing people, um, and uh, and and they're readily available. They don't. Embryonic stem cells have a lot more problems associated with them, um, and they're uh, you know there, there's all these sort of ethical for what for some people are questions and for us it's sort of like where's the question here um because we believe that human life uh, personhood uh, begins at conception and um and so uh, 
what it, it, it just sort of doesn't make sense that not only do you have adult stem cell therapy is doing really well. And I mean, people are walking who would, would have never walked again and, you know, and all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's this, like miraculous stuff. You just like inject it and boom, it works. I'm sure it's a little more complicated than that, but, um, but it just, it, in fact, I, I just heard a, um, a couple of weeks ago about a new, uh, treatment where they're able to manufacture organs, um, with, and, and, and the way it works is like, for instance, somebody has esophageal cancer and they need their esophagus, um, or a chunk of their esophagus removed. Well, that's kind of a problem. Okay. Um, so that means you need like a transplant or something like that. All right. Well, what they're able to do is to take stem cells from the person, from, from the, from the person who actually needs the, the treatment. They can take stem cells from that person. And then, uh, they, they use this sort of spongy material. Um, that's, it's almost like a, like a net, um, with, with little microscopic holes. And, and they form that in the shape of whatever organ they need, like an esophagus, right? And then they basically just, um, spread on, and I'm, I'm sure that anybody that knows about this would go, wow, you're, that's not exactly how it works, but, uh, they basically attach these stem cells, um, to this mesh and those stem cells go, and then, and then you put it in the person and the stem cells go, Oh, esophagus. Okay. I'll become an esophagus cell. And, and they're saying that, that theoretically they could create any organ using this process. It's it's fascinating stuff. Um, you know, it's you know, it's interesting that this company was just honest and saying, really, the the embryonic stem cell research is not going anywhere. Um, and so we're going to go strictly with adult because that's what that's what works. There's just no point. Um, no, not to mention the fact that they can manufacture embryonic stem cells without so, killing anyone. So there's just no point in doing it. I, I don't understand why they're still insisting on doing it. So I was happy to see them say no. Yeah. Uh, although I, I, although some of the, you know, well, there's a stellum, stellum cell researcher at Harvard and he, he doesn't like it. And then uh, I'm disgusted. Makes me sick. Says Daniel Hoyman, who's on the board of the Christopher and Dana Reed foundation to get people's hopes up and then do this for financial reasons. It's despicable. They're treating us like lab rats. That's right, Daniel. You see, we should get people's hopes up and then do it even though we're going to go broke if we do it. That way, we have a big company that doesn't do anything. I, I, I just love that. They're treating us like lab rats. It's biological scientific research. Uh, yeah, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I've got a, one of my Actually. members who has cancer and um, – kind of a rare form and she's been doing quite a bit of uh experimental research um and yeah she is a bit of a lab rat it's interesting actually up here in uh outside boston because whatever disease you have up here basically you can find a an experimental study for it so experimental treatment i mean between dana farber and uh harvard and a lot of these other places <laughs> you can be on the uh uh, the 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 the, tea, the the subway, and you'll see advertisements for. Do you have this problem? Um, are you open to being part of an experimental research? You know, we'll give you. You know, do pay for the drug. We'll pay for you to be involved. We'll do this, do that for you. Mm -hmm. and you get a stipend, and oh yeah, there's all kinds of stuff up here. So yeah, you know, the people get her lab rats all over the place. That's yeah, the yeah. idea of being they, experimental. They should be complaining. They're not treating us like lab rats. We want to be treated like lab rats, you know. <laughs> I, I so, don't know. That was, that was a funny quote. Okay, so that was kind of the outlier story. Well, the other outlier story. Then the other three kind of, I guess, cause get a little bit together somehow. I don't know. Um, is up in Canada. Now, uh, um, in British Columbia, 
<laughs> there was a uh, um, a group of fundamentalist Mormons up there who wanted to get involved in polygamy. Um, and they wanted to have all their, their various wives and stuff. A guy by the name of Winston Blackmore. And um, he has... Um, doesn't say how many wives he has. Just shows yeah. his daughters and grandkids. But anyway, it's a, it's a parent thing. Now I can't get over this. There was so there was this this court case, forty two days of legal arguments taking place uh, on the constitutionality of Section two ninety three of the Criminal Code, which deals with outlawing polygamy. And at the end of the whole thing. Um, they said they upheld Canada's polygamy laws. Um, but Oz says minors who end up in polygamous marriage should be exempt from prosecution. Um, and they gave a, a 335 page decision. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, no. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, but, uh, um, and he says it's uh, essentially about harm. Uh, more specifically, Parliament's reasoned apprehension of harm rising out of the practice of polygamy. This includes harm to women, to children, to society, and to the institution of monogamous marriage. Yeah, now, this is interesting, and, and there's... Um, a comment on it that that really caught my attention because you know we've talked about this before that once you sort of open the floodgates um, and allow marriage to be defined however people want, uh, poly- polygamy or polyamorous relationships are the first thing that are you know that's what's next, and um, and so that's been tested in Canada, and um, and and failed so far. But okay, so here's here's a comment um, on the story. So the laws about harm. Then where are the laws that make adultery illegal? I guess adultery doesn't harm anyone. Having a child out of wedlock where a good old daddy doesn't bother to stick around, shall we make that illegal too? The judge's logic is sometimes so baffling it makes one's head spin. I can't have two wives, but I can have I can be married to one, sleep with whomever I want, ditch wifey number one, live with my girlfriend and have another child from a previous relationship, and this is all okay. Solution for the dough heads in Bountiful, which the the city where the stuff was going on, don't fill out provincial marriage licenses. Just fill out church ones and never have the state sanction your union. Then in the eyes of the law, you're not really married, and you can live with, have sex with, and father children with whomever you want. I believe in most states there are multiple cohabitation laws, but not so in Canada. All right. Um, so, okay, so here's the deal. You know, people are going to argue that, well, this other thing is legal and, and it's allowed. All right, or there's no laws against that. All right, so why are they outlawing this particular one? All right, you know, for us, it's it's pretty straightforward. All right, here's what marriage is: it's one man, one ma- woman married for life. Anything, any deviation from that is really not acceptable. All right, but when you get into all this sort of technical legal stuff, um, then it gets complicated, right? And um, so so as as far as this sort of argument. What it comes down to is saying, okay, so just because the stuff is going on that really shouldn't be, doesn't mean that we have to allow everything that shouldn't go on to go on. And you know, uh, um, you know, there's only so many things that the court can that that's, that a court can deal with. Right. I mean, you know, uh, I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't regulate every aspect of people's behavior, unfortunately, but you can just the the, the, the government can decide what marriage we're going to recognize and which one we're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The interesting enough, by the way, it said that although this dealt with a Mormon polygamous community, um, it's there are uh, polygamists in the Muslim community in Canada, too. So it's going to also impact them. Yeah, I didn't realize that. So oh, that, that surprised me. I mean, there's also um, non-religious polygamous groups, too. Um that are just sort of hedonists, basically, um, <clears> that say, well, you know, we can define love and, and marriage however we want, and um, it's sort of moral relativism, so um, who are you to tell us we can't? And um, 
this is, and you talk about, um, I, I saw a statistic and, and I didn't, it was in a, a book that I'm reading, a, a, a book on marriage. Um, and, uh, so I, I but it was 60% of men and 40% of women have an adulterous affair at some point in their lives. That blew me away. And in fact, I'm a little skeptical of it. Um, yeah, but. that's, I know what, well, most of the time, uh, the couple of three times that they've, uh, they've had some of this, depends, which it really depends which study you look at, but I know a uh, lot like Sherry Heights report and that gained a lot of stuff. I remember it was like, I think sometimes in the nineties. Well, a lot of it, though, are surveys that are mailed out, and people fill them out and mail them back in. So how high a response rate did you get? And then it's almost a self-selected group because you have to have the desire to fill out the survey and send it back in. So who's more likely to do that? People who, you know, lives are kind of busy and they have nothing weird going on? Are people who have something strange going on? <laughs> well, you know, that's I, the thing is, I would like if, if somebody sent me a survey and said, um, "You know, are you always faithful to your wife?" I'd be quick to say, "Yes, I am." You know, I, I'm right. not having affairs, so I would, right. you know that would mean that it would skew even worse. But I mean, how did they? You know, where did they get the names? Where did they get the addresses? What brought the? You know, how do you develop this really random sample to make sure it's really random? Right. Yeah, I know. It, but I mean, if you, a couple of years ago, there was a guy um, at uh, there. There were two sur- surveys uh, uh, that I participated in coming out of uh, uh, the Fort Wayne Seminary. One was a student, uh, and he he was fortunate. He had uh, email. He 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 emailed every pastor in the synod. He had a web uh, survey for them to do. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Very easy to do this. And he had a very high response rate. I think he had like 80% of the pastors respond to it. Mm-hmm. Well, you can, that's pretty solid evidence there. Uh, and he had some very good questions. It was very well done. I don't know who helped him write his survey, but he did an awesome job. Yeah, I remember that one. I had one before that. Uh, a guy was working at a DMIN project on uh, communion attendance. And I happened to be doing my DMIN at the time, and he got a response from me, ripping apart his survey. Um, basically, it came down to really two questions. A, do you have communion every week in your church? B, you know, if yes, thank you. If no, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, you know, it came up with all these other things. But it, you know, I mean, it was, but really it was biased in this favor of you should be doing this every week. Don't you know that there's these resources? I mean, it was just, it was, you know, I said, you know, and some of your questions that you ask, you know, information should have no bearing on how often one communes. You know, and so you're asking questions. I don't even see what the relevance is. Oh, that's uh, sort of like the, our, uh, our school district just uh, put out a, a web survey. And uh, and it was like, if you knew this, would you vote that way on the levy? If you knew this, like, oh, so you're interested in how much people actually know about you know the different things, and and you know you're you're not. <laughs> it was it was like you're as much trying to disseminate information as you're trying to receive it, you know. That's right. Uh, that's a put. That's almost like a push pull. Yeah. And uh, so you have to be very careful. So I'd like to see on, the, on, a, on a survey like the one you're citing, what was the actual evidence? What were the questions? Who who got the inform- Who got who? To whom do they send it to? How did they select these people? All those things come into to, to play. What was the response rate? You know, right. oh, we sent out a hundred thousand of them. How many did you get back? Oh, we got back ten thousand. Well, if you get a ten percent response rate, I got news for you: your your your, your stuff's no good. Yeah. You, so, what was the response rate to to it? Um, you know. So, there's there's a lot of stuff in, in filling and doing surveys and filling that information out and stuff. So, the, they the book, say, by the they, way, yeah. 
uh, surveys aside, um, is called Becoming Your Spouse's Better Half, Why Differences Make a Marriage Great, uh, by Rick Johnson. And, and I do, I recommend the book. He, uh, I, I don't recommend that you take everything that, you know, sort of read it with a discerning eye. I I don't think it's necessarily in the sense of bad theology, but, um, I think some of his assertions are more based on his personal experience than, um, a lot of, you know, studies in that. Um, but it's, it's from, you know, he talks to a lot of people on that, but, um, it's a good book. And it's a, it's a sort of Christian version of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, but it's, it, it talks about those, those differences and, uh, it's, it's got some pretty good insights. So I recommend it. So, yep. Oh, let's move on here. Let's talk about the uh, Harper Collins. This is interesting. Uh, back, this is from October, but, uh, uh um, Harper Collins, which already owns um, Zondervan Corporation, has now bought Thomas Nelson, Bible publishers. They now run about 50% of the Christian publishing market. Um, that is huge. Mm-hmm. Um I've kind of reminded back in the days of Keith Green back in the 60s, uh, back in the 70s when he talked about uh, when ABC bought uh, Word Incorporated and Thomas Nelson uh, uh, later on bought that and then sold it. But I just remember him saying, there's money to be made in Jesus' name and the world is going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So and for anybody that's not familiar, HarperCollins is owned by Rupert Murdoch. News right, part of that, part of his whole um, uh, publishing empire. Um, it's interesting because I had a, about 10 years ago, was it about 10? I think it's so. We had a uh, pastor's conference up here by this guy who was very skeptical of um, textual criticism and uh, was pretty much pushing what he called the, the ecclesiastical text. Uh, basically, it was the Texas Receptus, and he really encouraged people to you to go with uh, King James, and uh, especially or the New King James Bible. He really liked that and stuff. And one of the things he complained about in this stuff was that uh, 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 Zondervan uh, is that the uh, uh, NIV was being published by Zondervan, which was owned by Rupert Murdoch. And he put some of the other stuff up there that, you know, <laughs> Rupert Murdoch also owns, some of the tabloids and things like that. And uh, I just told – I just ripped into the guy. He didn't like me after that. And I said, that, you know, that's an unfair comment because, you know, Zondervan and, and the NIV have had this agreement since the 19, you know, late 1970s, you know. Rupert Murdoch just bought uh, through Harper Collins just bought Zondervan a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. You know what you're saying is is technically accurate, but really has nothing to do with one with the other. So, uh, but now this is this is huge uh, with, with them now owning owning oh you know uh, uh, and Thomas Nelson. I mean they've got all kinds of stuff that they publish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and my, so does Zondervan. My favorite. My my sort of Bible that I use when I'm not using a digital edition um, is uh, Thomas Nelson, um, an ASB from – it was a confirmation gift from my grandparents, and I still use it all the time. Love it. And uh, one of the things that's kind of neat, though, that they've been able to do with uh, Harper Collins, which is more of a, um, a secular publisher – is that in some situations they've been able to double publish books, and so publishing it under the Harper Collins imprint to go into a lot of regular bookstores, and then publishing it under the Zondervan imprint, also to put it in a lot of Christian bookstores. Yeah, that's good. I my biggest concern about this is not about Rupert Murdoch or anything like that. Um, you know, as long as these places are making money, News Corp is gonna and you know the the powers that be are gonna keep their hands off of it um and my concern is 
that these big corporations are a lot more particular about how their products are being used, right? And so, for instance, um, the NIV, as an example, has some of the strictest copyright uh, licensing as of any tra- biblical translation I've seen. Um, I am a user of Online Bible and have been for many years. Uh, application for the Macintosh. Uh, there's a Windows version too, but um, it was the NIV in it has been the British NIV because they couldn't get the rights, um, even as a paid license, to use the American NIV in it. And um, and there's been uh, it's it's just been a real headache with all the different translations that they have available for it. That's the one, and and I, um, the previous uh, programmer uh, of that application, uh, Ken Hamill, who's now in heaven. Uh, I had some conversations with him uh, about different things, and um, and he expressed his frustration. In, in dealing with that, trying to get the licensing and stuff like that. And, uh, and, it, and it's just, it, when you've got, w- when you work with Christian organizations, um, and, and it's not the, the profit isn't the primary purpose in existing, uh, you do things a little bit differently. And, but that's, that's strange because you version has it. Uh, with no problem, and you can pay for it, or you can get it for free. Um, I used to get um, uh, Accordance had the NIV. Yeah, well, uh, and they, I, I'm not sure now, and and I don't know if they've pursued it, but I think it was because it was you know years ago that that may have changed. I don't know, but um, I I, I just know that there's been a lot of of problems with that and and now they i think they've they've loosened up a little bit probably because there's a lot more competition and they need the exposure um because for a while the niv was the top selling uh modern trend english translation mm-hmm. uh, so i can't see you know and, and as far as i knew it's actually just the opposite it was actually very easy to get the copyright that's why um cph that's why uh the lutheran worship uh, uh was based in on the NIV it was because the Zondervan and uh, the International Bible Society would basically let any Christian group use it for free. Hmm. There were no royalties or anything. So I don't know. Maybe there's something about his particular thing that they were very suspicious of or something. Hmm. Oh, it could be that. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, <clears throat> my problem is, you know, <laughs> it's just yeah, you know, when, when corporate stuff. I mean, my next question, I looked at this and said, okay, so good. Rupert Murdoch, who owns, you know, Fox Network and stuff, now owns Zondervan and Tommy Nelson, uh, Thomas Nelson. Great. So now do we come out with the Simpsons Bible? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, oh, you know, what happened under Tommy Nelson, you know? I mean, how much, um, you know, uh, impact editorially? Will be on that from high from other sources. I mean, or are these different organizations very separate? Yeah. You know. Well, you know, you mentioned the King James. How much? Edit, you know, it's named after the king. All right. How much editorial uh, input do you think he had? <laughs> Don't know. But it's going to be interesting to see how that comes up. Speaking of online stuff and online Bibles and files. This is a bizarre story uh, out of Sweden. Well, that makes sense. Bizarre things out of there. And a file sharing group that considers itself a spiritual organization has said last Thursday that Sweden has recognized it as a religious community. The Church of Kopimism. Kopimism. K-O-P-I-M-I-S-M. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, they have 3,000 members every week. 
that meet to share files of music, films, and other content they consider holy and regard copying as a sacrament. <laughs> he says the church's philosophy opposes copyrights in all form and encourages piracy of all types of media, including music, movies, TV shows, and software. My son should be a member of this. <laughs> uh, now you get the MPAA and the RIA going to be down his throat. Um, oh. <clears throat> so Sweden's kind of famous because, uh, as far as file sharing goes, because of all the, the Pirate Bay uh, file sharing website was based out of Sweden. And um, the who I wouldn't know anything about that website. <laughs> Never heard of it. Well, they give you the. I'm yes, a the, pirating virgin. I'm sorry. <laughs> there, there are better ones out there than that one, anyway. <laughs> oh, like what? Which ones? Uh, they've all been taken down now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I used to use ISO Hunt. No, I didn't do it for so. illegal purposas, but there are certain things Never, you get. Huh? No, via, you know, BitTorrent. That, uh, you know, they were just more readily available that way. But um, the uh, <sighs> being recognized by the state of Sweden is a large step for all of copy me <laughs> or copy me. <laughs> Hopefully this is one step toward the day when we can live out our faith without fear of persecution. Uh, yeah, that might be copy me ism. Copy me, yep. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. Of course, this is Sweden. It also says they recognize people, have recognized believers of Norse paganism, elves, and gnomes. So, yeah, well, we talked about that, what, a month or so ago? About um, people that in, was it Sweden? No, it was Iceland, wasn't it? Believe in elves and gnomes? Uh, it could be, but, you know. So, um, I, this is another one of those cases where somebody wants to do something illegal, and so they claim, um, oh, well, it's our religion. And so you're not going to stomp on uh, freedom of religion, are you? And, um, you know, the, the way that that religious freedom has always been, uh, or, or at least needs to be, uh, understood is, uh, so long as you're not stepping on anybody else, fine. As long as you're not causing harm or endangerment or infringing on somebody else's rights. Well, copyright is a right. You know, it's, it's right in the, the, the word. Well, it's, it's, it's protection. I, I created this. Therefore, it's mine. Uh, you know, I I wrote a sermon series a few years ago. Um, I held, held the copyright on that. Felt very good about that. And then uh, CPH bought the sermon series from me. And uh, I signed the copyright over to them. And Dale had a, I don't even know if your that website still exists or not. Yeah, it is. Uh, Okay, but I had had the the, um, the files up on that, and I contacted him and said, you need to take them down. I no longer own the copyright. Mm -hmm. And so he took them all away, away from there uh, because I know I uh, – every once in a while, somebody will – who's using this – still using the series 10 years later will write to me and say – um, you know, because there's two of the sermons that weren't printed. Do you have the other two? And I'll say, yes, would you like the original files? And that way you don't have to retype everything. Mm -hmm. And they're always very grateful to get those, but they already own the magazine, the, the magazine. And I think, okay, I'm just saving them having to type a few, uh, type a few things. Uh, but, uh, but that's, uh, you know, but, but if somebody had taken that and copied it and taken it without my permission, Without their permission, I'd be very upset. Um, matter of fact, I remember I had a guy in my last church. There's a pastor of a, a, another church in our circuit who apparently really liked my newsletter articles because he would copy them. 
Now, his church happened to be named Trinity, and his first name happened to be Jim. So there would be these exact copies of our newsletter, front page, my stuff, signed Pastor Jim. And no acknowledgement that I was actually the writer of it. And I got a little irritated by that. Mm-hmm. And personally, I think any – I don't know. If I was a, somebody in Sweden and one of these things, I would say, um, you know, file sharing is a sacrament. You've got to be kidding me. Forget mm-hmm. it. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, and, you know, you can you can argue about what is or isn't ridiculous, but what it comes down to is they're stepping on people's rights um, by doing this and uh, very clearly – and look, here's here's the thing. This is that's that's sort of the whole religious angle, all right. Just from a, a personal angle, um, you know, I, I have my my thoughts on the way copyright is um, in Western culture, um, and uh, and so I'm just gonna you know expound a little opinion here. And part of the problem is that the copyright laws cannot keep up with the technology as, as technology is changing, uh, file sharing, you know, as we move to digital mediums on, on things where it's easy to move things from one place to another. Um, it, it's easy to, um, to and, and, and the way we're using things, we're using them differently now than we used to. Uh, there's a whole question of how, you know, how do we deal with all this stuff? We're dealing with it in the church on how different things are used. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for example, right, the CCLI license, Christian Copyright License Institute, something like that, um, that allows you to use most like contemporary worship and stuff like that. You're muted, by the way, Jim. Um, there you go. Um, they allow, um, they allow you on if you use like PowerPoint or something like that to put the lyrics to music up on a screen during a worship service. You can put the words up, but you can't put the score up. All right. So if it's an unfamiliar song um, and you want to have the actual music up there so people that can read music can more easily sing it, you can't do that. You can, however, print it in your bulletins. So it's not okay to have the music up there, um, you know, for a few seconds, but it is okay to hand somebody a piece of paper that they can take home that has the score on it, right? And and I was talking to the I was talking to somebody at CCLI about it, and I said that makes no sense. And she said, "Yeah, I know, but it's the way the the licenses are right now. It's you know, so." They can't keep up with it. Now, what I am a big advocate of is um, the open source community and um, and what they call copy left, uh, which is instead of all rights reserved, is some rights reserved. Um, and uh, it's the idea of, of sharing your stuff but still retaining uh, a degree of control over it. And uh, probably the most commonly used one is called Creative Commons, uh, where you can say, um, all right, you can use this, but uh, you know anybody can use it, but uh, with these restrictions, uh, and and the different available restrictions that uh, that artists and writers and whoever um, can use our attribution, which is um, you can use it, but you have to give me credit for it. Um, you can't say it's your own or, or whatever. I, I you need to attribute my name to it somehow. Um, uh, uh, non-commercial or, or or commercial do you allow um, are, is it as long as you're a non-profit organization you can use it um, you can't or you can't use it for monetary gain um, if you want to do that you got to contact me because I'm probably going to want to cut um, another one is uh, uh, whether you can modify it or not you know, can you can you take this and use it in your own work? Can you modify it somehow? Uh, you know, if it's a song, are you allowed to change the verses uh, and use most of it? And and one of the ways that one of the options there is what they call share alike, is that you can um, you can change it, 
but you can't change the conditions of the license. So in other words, if you make changes, you can't, you have to also, when you distribute it, you also have to allow anybody else that wants to change it to also change it. Um, and it's, and, and I, I really like it because it allows people to retain a certain degree of control over their stuff, but also make it readily available to others. So like when I'm putting together my, um, my sermon, all right. And I use pictures for my sermon. Um, I will use sites like Flickr and DeviantArt and, um, and other sites that use creative commons. Um, oh, uh, Wiki, Wikipedia, Wikimedia, um, a lot of public domain stuff, but, uh, there's also some creative Commons stuff out there that, um, where you can use these pictures. You don't have to get licensed, you know, uh, in writing or whatever permission to use the stuff. Um, but you can, you get permission. And then what we do is at the end of the service, there's a slide in the PowerPoint that's, uh, um, acknowledgements and it just has a little sort of bullet list of, all of the different creative commons, um, the, it, it'll have the title, the author and the, those conditions, uh, attribution, non-commercial, whatever, you know, and, and nobody really reads it, but if anybody actually was curious about, Oh, where'd you get that picture from? We could go back and we could tell them and, um, and we're fulfilling the, um, the requirements of the law that way and, and giving the people the proper credit for their work. So, I, I'm, and, and people still make money doing it that way too. Uh, there's a lot of, of musicians out there that have their music licensed through Creative Commons, and, and what they do is they make um, they make it available for free that you can download it. But then if you want, um, like, not all of their music is. So if you like their stuff, you, you know, go buy the album or or go buy these other ones that are not available for free. Um, or, uh, you can get the low quality version for free. If you want the high quality version of the MP3, you can, uh, pay for that. Or if you just want to support the artist and encourage them to write more songs, you know, you can do that sort of thing. Um, some of them will put their artwork out. If they're artists, they'll put their artwork out there, um, sort of as a, as a resume, um, and and say you know if, if you like my artwork if you're if you need any done you can hire me to um to you know you commission uh, uh custom artwork that kind of thing so there's a there is a business model behind it too uh if you're not talking about churches so i know really sort of off the religious news subject but since we're talking about copyrights one of my hobby horses so um the part of the problem is of a lot of this stuff when it comes to file sharing in this case is that their 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 television shows, movies, things like that, music that, you know, this is really, you know, the livelihood of companies and a lot of other people. Mm-hmm. Uh so that can be a problem. At the same time while um uh, against this idea of piracy, uh, uh I also have problems with the uh Stop Online Piracy Act going before Congress. Basically not that I support piracy but because it's if there's an alleged piracy thing, which may or may not be true, it automatically comes down. Well, my goodness, can you imagine just the amount of mischief of people alleging there's piracy going on and seeing sites going being taken down day, you know, just left and right? And a lot of these places, once it's taken, I can see a lot of political problems. You know, if a, a, a right ring or left ring blogger and I'm going to make the the accusation. They automatically have to shut it down, and then where do you go? Right. You have to prove your innocence. Yeah, it's shoot first, ask questions later. Yep, it's a very bad thing. I, but that's the far cry from saying that that uh, piracy is a sacrament. Yeah. Anyway, so our last one then. Uh, go out to San Juan, California. Uh, again, another one. Weird one. Now. I think we may have talked about the situation a while. Yeah, we have. Maybe, possibly more than once. Okay. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so um, there's this couple on San Juan Capistrano. Um, and no, they did not worship swallows. Instead, they were having a uh, Bible study in their home. And uh, now I don't know how old. There were up to 50 people. Uh, 
And so uh, uh, now I grant there's probably some some traffic problems with 100 people. Um, and the uh, city of San Juan said, you need to get a permit. And they said, no, we don't. <laughs> These are parties or whatever. Uh, and so they uh, got uh, – were, were fined $100 the first time and $200 the second time. And for some weird reason that the city couldn't understand, they were inundated with angry letters from all around the country. Because they were having an in-home Bible study. And it you know. piled up a number of people. So yeah, now the city's said, reimbursed them. <laughs> yeah, I said, well, they didn't know if they were a church or not, you know, and that's what they needed to figure out. Well, if you need to figure that out, how about figuring, how about not fi- uh, 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 fighting them till you figure that out? <laughs> no, we're going to find first and then figure it out. And, uh, you know, and so they filed suit in August and, uh, the um, city said, oh, well, uh, my bad, and refunded them the money. I would have said refund the money, plus you have to pay uh, uh, the, court, the the money we paid a lawyer so far or give him something, plus you have to pay us interest on our money that you've held. I think 25% would be a fair interest rate. <laughs> so, I mean, all right, so you have to understand that um, – you know, they live in this neighborhood and every week 50 people show up um, for this Bible study. Okay. So which could create, you know, there's a, there's a comment that, all right, you know, if my neighbors uh, a few times a year have family over for uh, some sort of celebration or whatever, um, and, you know, and, and 50 people show up, you're going to have some parking problems on the street and, and things like that. But, all right, somebody's having a party, you know, people have the right to have a party and they have the right to have their neighbors over or their, their family over or friends or whatever. But this was every week and it was 50 people, you know, that could create a real problem for the neighbors. Okay. Um, I can... See what... Oh, go ahead. But you see, I'm confused as to how this is supposed to help anything. Because it says, um, it says, um, it's a weekly Bible study on Sundays that sometimes drew up to 50 people. So they need to get this, this permit. So they change the thing. Uh, and it says, under the new definition, gatherings occurring once than less, less than once a week for fewer than 25 people would not have to apply for the permit. So they would still have to. Yeah. <laughs> so so they, they basically exempted these people from it. But now it's in writing. So anybody else, these people get sort of grandfathered. But anybody else that wants to do the same exact thing is going to have the same exact problem. Right. Now, this question of, um, you know, whether they were a church or not... I, you know, th- th- it is an interesting question, all right? Because, well, let's see, you're meeting once a week, gathering around God's Word. You have the same people showing up week after week. Yeah, but, you know, it kind of sounds like a church. You know, there's I know of cell churches and things that are other sort of home-based churches that have a whole lot less people than that. Um yeah, you, know, you could argue, well, this is for study, not worship, or something like that. But yeah, you know, in the eyes of the government, they don't really see a difference in that. Um, but the, I mean, what it comes down to, though, is the onus is on the government to figure out, okay, government, how do you define church? You know, and so they've they've kind of tried to do that. But the problem is, this churches come in all shapes and sizes, and so it's really hard to determine what exactly does that mean. It makes more sense to to look at this strictly from a, um, a a practical use of the property and space kind of issue, and and say, um, and sort of leave the whole church, nonprofit, whatever thing out of it, and just say um, that people can only have X number of 
of guests on and, and define a, on a regular basis and regardless of the purpose. So. Now it's interesting. Our, um, they, they, they're looking down the comments on this, by the way. Um, it says that this guy, uh, 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 uh the, uh, <clears throat> the, the head of it says, uh, they, uh, uh, have wide public streets. They live in a cul-de-sac and the, uh, street only has houses on one side of the street for an entire block. So in other words, they had plenty of room for parking for people and other people would have had two. Um, <laughs> it was, ba- they had one complaint. Um, and, um, the same complaint originally they met, apparently they live in some sort of, uh, Closed area or something because they have a they had a community clubhouse, and originally they met in this community clubhouse, and the same complainant was the one who lobbied against them being in the community clubhouse, which would have had parking. <laughs> yeah, which would have you know, um, right. So in that case, we're talking so now about trying just to like a Bible study get a change in the homeowners association. That will open it up to regular meetings of all kinds, Boy Scouts, knitting groups, whatever. Apparently now it has to be something just dealing with that community. Um, you know, uh, the planning committee shouldn't pointing out Tuesday there's no magic number. 25 or 50 meeting in one home property, such as ours, uh, one and a half acres and a home of 4,700 square feet, uh, is one thing. Something else that's less rural and more dense would be something else. I have no idea what that meant. So, there may be there are different sized properties, and what is appropriate for one may not be appropriate for another. Oh, and they were enforced. They were reported to the enforcement officer because this uh, Chuck Fromm, the guy that leads it, he actually responded in the comments. Um, we were reported to the enforcement officer by an anonymous complainant. The same complainant lobbied against us. Um, at the meetings using the clubhouse. All right. So, it, yeah. All right. It's anonymous, but when you make a complaint to the police, you have to identify yourself. You can just choose to not let anybody else know. But apparently it was determined or, or released that it was the same person. So, so yeah. person apparently doesn't want to take credit. Chris. No. Or, or whatever. But, uh, that's a, you know, fortunately, it's glad to see that some of the stuff did get resolved eventually. But that uh, should should get resolved a little easier. Anyway, that brings us to the end of tonight, I think. Uh, hope you all have a good 2012. Uh, I hope it's a lot quieter than 2011 was. And, uh, and pray for our country as we're heading into the silly season, better known as the presidential election times. I am so glad not to be in Iowa right now. <laughs> I don't miss caucus season. I know in Ohio we'll get it at the end because as they used to say, we're a swing state about Iowa. Um, one guy asked if he was going to support somebody for president. I don't know. I met the guy three times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, so take care, my friend, and uh, we will be back on next week. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless. Mm-hmm.